just north of Birmingham, the motorway cops are on their way to an accident on the M6. On to uh, this RTC that we're going to at Hilton. Uh, can you just confirm the highways are on route over? PC's Paul Clackett and Helen Reynolds have been told there's at least one casualty. When you hear the word injury, you start thinking, I hope it's not too bad, but you've got to be prepared for the worst. Oh, he just looks in his mirror. Ooh. Oh, there's a surprise. But inattentive drivers are getting in their way. I find it incredible that despite being lit up like a Christmas tree, motorists still fail to see us, they still fail to look in the mirrors. Three mirrors and they just don't use them. It's extremely frustrating. As they approach the accident scene, the traffic has been brought to a standstill. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. The outside lane has already been coned off. It's clear this is a major accident. There are three vehicles in lane three. The rear vehicle, which was a tipper, had run into the back of a blue sports car, which had then been pushed into another vehicle in front of it. A woman driver of the car is injured and causing concern to the motorway cops. The lady in the car appeared to be injured and trapped in the car. So I went to her and made sure that um, she wasn't too distressed and tried to put her mind at rest. Yeah, it's the fire we gave you. Get this roof off this car. Yeah, we can do. No, that's fine. That'll do us. OK, we'll let the ambulance be for treatment. Yeah, all right. The, the patient in the car has uh, got possible neck back injuries, so they've requested the fire brigade to uh, remove the roof, turn it into a convertible, basically so she can be extracted safely without causing any more uh, injury. I'm basically talking to the driver at the front in the other, in the pickup. This car's stationary, and it looks like a momentary lapse in concentration from the rear driver. He's braked, skidded, and uh, rear-ended them. You're the driver, yeah. aren't you? Can you just come down? PC to Reynolds vehicle? needs to question the driver of the lorry who ran into the back of the car. Drivers of big vehicles and a momentary lapse in concentration is a lethal cocktail. Take some details off you. They're travelling same sort of speeds as cars but they have to give themselves larger distances to break. Can you just tell me what happened? I'm just going to jump down. Can't really tell you. We just looked up and everything had just stopped. So just following the flow of traffic. Which one going fast anyway? The fire brigade have just arrived with the vital equipment needed to cut the woman free of the wreckage. With, with these sort of injuries, it's just a matter of... Uh, there's possible neck and back injuries, so they have to look at the worst scenario. And to get her out with the roof on, they start to have to twist her and do things like that, which they don't want her to do if she has got back or neck injuries, because you would only worsen it. So to be safe, the cars are right off, so they'll uh, take the roof off, and then they can get her out without twisting her. We've had two crews, one each side doing that. The A post has been done both sides now. We've cut the windscreen across with the glass management saw, and the roof will go off now, all in one. Taking the roof off is the easy part. Moving the injured woman is a much more delicate job. The ambulance crew had to be very careful in extracting the lady because there was a possible spinal injury. They needed to get the board in behind her so she could be put on it with as little movement as possible to her back. So the only way that could be done is by taking the roof off and slowly she was pulled up onto the board, keeping her spine as straight and as immobile as possible. While the medics work out how to move her safely, the cops have a different problem, dealing with inquisitive motorists. People want to have a look, see what's going on. They don't realise that they could be slowing down and having a 44 tonner up the back end. But as soon as you put a uniform in front of them, start waving their arm, they all speed up, because they know they'll get shouted at. See, if you look at it now, it's going slow. Come on. Clacks wave. He's always doing it, so he's famous for it. He makes me laugh doing it. Helps to keep you fit as well. The truck driver can't account for his failure to stop in time. You just all happened so fast. You just don't know what happened, mate, to be honest with you. Just all happened so fast. Yeah, we were, we were a bit of a shock, a big shock. 
Just as long as the lady's all right, that's all it matters. The good news is the injured woman is finally out of the wreckage and on her way to hospital. And now the motorway cops have a suspicion that lack of attention may not be the only cause of the accident. Looking at the vehicle, it might be uh, interesting to put it over a way bridge because it looks quite heavy. Drive? Yep. Better look at your vehicle. Yep. And one of the things I think might be contributing is the weight of the vehicle. So when it's being recovered, we're going to take it down to our compound and put it over the way bridge right. just to see what the weights are. One of the contributory factors to the accident was the fact that the vehicle had been overweight. This could have been a lot worse. Had the speeds been higher, the impact speed would have been greater and the injuries would have, could have been a lot more serious, if not fatal. Further south, near Birmingham's Spaghetti Junction, Sergeant Mark Tonks is on patrol. Even though he's in charge, Sergeant Tonks still relishes time out on the road. Being a supervisor on the motorway, you're lucky really because you still get the chance to come out and do patrol, um, which is I suppose really why we all join. He spotted a problem. Just looking at this transit van here in lane two, you can see from the position of the vehicle on the road that the back end is way down on the back, so in effect he's surfboarding. When I saw the van, it was obvious that he was overweight. I'm not going to turn a blind eye to it um, because if anything had have happened three junctions down and I'd have later attended and saw the same vehicle involved, then I wouldn't have been able to, to live with myself. So he was going to come in to the motorway centre to be weighed. Half a mile away at Perry Bar in Birmingham, the cops use a specialist site which can weigh vans, trucks and lorries. And this is where Sergeant Tonks is taking the van. Hello, drive. White van man isn't happy. Right. You seem to have it in for us. Why are you? Well, you only called our lads out the other week. Me? I don't know if it was you. Well, how do I know who you are then? But it was the same van. Well, we're going to have a look at it then, see what, what it weighs. What did it weigh last time? I don't know. What should it weigh this time? What's your carrying weight? Three and a half. Is it three and a half? Where's your plate? Where's your manufacturer's plate? <coughs> it should be on, the, on either the driver's door or the passenger door. Be on the passenger door then. <coughs> it's the second time the van has been pulled up for being overweight. So why have we got it in for you then? If you look overweight, then you're always going to get pulled in. Oh. And you've only got to look at this van and see how it's surfing at the back to suggest that it possibly is overweight. So if you're going to carry on loading like this, you will get pulled in. Okay. Yeah, I think it shouldn't be overweight. Well, well, if you're just saying shouldn't be, you should know. You're the driver. You're responsible. So it's all right sitting there moaning, well, saying, yeah, no, well, I'm hang on. You, stuff, well, you, well, how do you think, how am I going to weigh you on the bridge? You're the driver. You're responsible. So you should know what the vehicle I can carry. Well, if you know what I'm saying, no point sitting there whinging. If your vehicle's underweight, then fine. But if it's overweight and it's involved in an accident, and if it goes to the nth degree where somebody's killed yeah. as a result well, of an overweight vehicle... Or could cause an accident at the end of the day. Exactly, yeah. And if you can live with that, then it's on your conscience. So you're the driver, so you're responsible for the weight and what's in the back of it. Well, it shouldn't be overweight. Well, the only one way we've got to find it out is picking on the scales. Or the myth that people have with vans of, say, up to three and a half ton transit type vans, they think that they can carry three and a half ton in payload, when in reality it's three and a half ton gross weight. That's the load, the van, the fuel, them, and everything. Now, PC Dave Gaunt is coming to help weigh the van. The manufacturers uh, provide a maximum weight for the vehicle and the axles because any uh, further weight to those uh, axles could potentially cause uh, strain and cause them to fail. It affects your braking, your steering. You are over, mate. Um, not by a great deal, but we're just going to work it out as a percentage and then that'll tell us what we're going to do with you. 13. 13? And it's 5% on gross. Before he can go on his way, the driver must unload his kit. It was amazing the amount of um, stuff that he had to take off the vehicle to actually get his vehicle underweight. But the big surprise is right at the back. 
half a ton of ready mix cement. Two barrows of cement later, the van is ready to be tested again. That's fine. Yeah, okay at that. Just don't chuck anything else on there while we've gone. Third time lucky. Third time lucky. I tell you, it's amazing how much you have to take off for it to start to, to come down. He had to call his dad to come with a, another van to go and pick up all the rest of his stuff so that they can get on with the job. Back on the M6, PC's Richard Elliott and Stuart Bullard are out in the unmarked car on the lookout for other drivers who ignore the rules of the road. PC Elliott has spotted an all too familiar problem up ahead. No seatbelt on this uh, Chinese gen. See if the passenger is now. No, passenger's no, not either. Neither of them are wearing seatbelts. Little high undie. PC Elliott knows that minor offences can lead to bigger things. It does seem to be the case that people who break one law sometimes are willing to break others as well. We stopped you because you're travelling up the M6 northbound, obviously, uh, not wearing your seatbelt. Is there any reason why you're not wearing your seatbelt? Well, the weather is about hot. Yeah, all right. Have you got your driving licence with you? No. No, OK. You're not exempt from wearing your seatbelt for any reason. There's no medical reason why you can't wear it or... The cops are checking his insurance and his driving documents. What insurance are you driving on? Uh, Churchill. Sorry? Churchill. Churchill. Right. You say you have a Chinese licence? Have you changed that for a provisional in this country? Uh, I applied the provisional. Right. Do, do you have it at home or not? Uh, no. I think I lost it already. While PC Elliott checks out the passenger, PC Bullard has just received information about the man's licence. It would appear that your driving licence, your provisional one, has expired. Has it? It's like, uh... You can't use your Chinese licence here. Do you have a... a I apply the one. You've got a, a learner licence, provisional. Mm -hmm. But the passenger yeah, can't, can't drive the car either. either. OK. Having established that he's got no licence, no insurance, then the next thing I'm going to do is seize the vehicle. We've arranged for recovery via Staffordshire Police. Um, we're going to take the vehicle off to a safer place because obviously there's a small baby in the vehicle. All we're going to do is take the car off to the next junction because it's a bit safer. Okay. It's a bit easier to recover it from there as well. So uh, you will be able to get it back. We have to come back here again. But you would have to come back to collect it, yeah. Mm. Or somebody you know would. Mm. With a full license. With a full license and insurance, yeah. Do we have to pay to get the car back? You do. How well, much the family will be? It's £105 to get the car back and then £12 for every day it's there if you get it back. So the quicker you collect it, the less money it costs. It's not designed to be a punishment, the recovery fee, but in some respects it is a punishment to some sort and you know that that person has been inconvenienced. PC Elliot has arranged for the recovery truck to give them a lift into town. Their child seat comes off anyway, so uh, it's a proper child seat. Thanks for that. No problem. We'll see you again soon, no doubt. See ya. Ten miles south, there's a much more immediate problem for the motorway cops. It's causing the motorway network around Birmingham to come to a halt. A lorry has shed its load of steel coils, each one weighing more than two tonnes. Two lanes of the motorway have been closed to traffic just in case more coils fall from the lorry. The situation is so serious that Sergeant Mark Tonks is on his way there. This is the steel coil, the junction nine of us. But the accident is not the only problem Sergeant Tonks has to sort out. 
the fire brigade have arrived to help move the two-ton coils, but they aren't seeing eye to eye with the highways agency. Yeah, the highways have a problem with the fire chief. He's overruling them at the scene, uh, saying that he's in charge, and uh, until the police come uh, take the scene off him, uh, he'll be closing the motorway when he wants to over. There was some debate going on between the fire service that was in attendance and the highways agency that, who had their crews on scene. And as you can see, it's all three lanes that are stationary, but for some reason, the fire brigade um, have closed Junction 9. The highways want to keep the motorway flowing. Fire commander had said he wanted a total closure. I was a supervisor for that section of, of motorway, so we went and tried to sort it out. But getting through the traffic is Sergeant Tonks's immediate concern. Everywhere on the network, basically, was starting to grind to a halt, all because of this one incident. Just rever reverse back so we can get in the gap. Reverse back. Go back a little bit. We appreciate the problems of the motorists, but we've got a job to do, and we'd like to get there as quickly as we can, but sometimes you just can't. We've just got to sit it out and wait for a gap to appear, or do your best to manufacture one. Right, these are the fire brigade. They're various specialist vehicles. So what we've got to go and try and find, there. there's a fireman with a white hat, and then find out why. Fire brigade always wear yellow hats. Uh, their gaffer will always wear a white hat. So it's the white hat that we go for to speak uh, to. On the motorway side, you've been sent up. What's happened? Or with you and the highways, or? Well, uh, look, we've got here. This wagon was parked about here. Right. So all, yeah, I'll show you. Some of the brakes are OK. All those rolls are hanging off quite precariously, so right, yeah, they weigh yeah. 2.1 tonnes each. Yeah. Plus when the banding comes undone, they, yeah. they spin out to 100 metres. Yeah, yeah, we don't want that, do we? So we had traffic going past, so I stopped the traffic. OK. I've got the wagon moved off here, so put it in a bit of a better position, so right. they weren't so precarious. And at the moment, we just, uh, we just, basically, what, what I'm trying to do is counter the load. When, yeah. we, when we put one on, we take one off to one side. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, my worry is that 2.1 tonnes, there's one there about to roll off, is it? My worry is if he does, there's traffic going past here. It's just going to write off the car completely. Fair enough. At the end of the day, you can override me, but... No, 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 I'm happy with that. Because yeah. if they do go, they'll go. I agreed with the fire brigade that Lane 3 would stay shut. Had we allowed Lane 3 to run, uh, no doubt we'd have pleased hundreds of members of the public by letting them get through and, and continue with their journey. But had one coil gone twang, and the coal gone across and it would have penetrated a car and it had it severed, you know, potentially somebody's head. And we overruled the highways and said, no, it'll stay shut. Because the potential for, for a fatality was, was, was greater. Thousands of motorists are stuck in the tailback simply because the steel coils have not been loaded correctly. They should be stacked face down. But they stacked them like this. Stacked them in a rock and roll. Apparently a white transit pulled in front of him and he had to slam on his anchors and, and the whole, them to whole move. lot went forward. If they were stacked flat, perhaps they wouldn't have fell off. The northbound carriageway remains closed while the whole load is taken off and restacked correctly. No matter how long it takes. I said how long's a piece of string? Um, and he said probably, uh, yeah, how long's a piece of metal? And he said probably 30 minutes. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay here just to keep the peace, basically. If it was my first incident on the motorway and the fire brigade commander had said, this is going to take 30 minutes, I'd have said, yes, OK, it's 30 minutes, and believed him. Um, but being up here since, off and on since 1994, it's, it, it's never been the case. If they say 30 minutes, you can guarantee it's going to be a minimum of 60 minutes. This section of the M6 is known as the busiest junction in Europe, um, junction sort of 8 to 10. It's always heavily congested for the reason being just behind me there, you've got the link to the M5, which is the start of the southbound carriageway. Um, so this section of motorway, in theory, you've got six lanes of motorway coming into, into sort of one part, in effect. It even gets congested there, where vehicles are meant to be leaving the M6. So he couldn't have picked a worse place, really, to, have a, to lose his load. 
Have you got somebody down at Junction 9? But Sergeant yeah, Tonks yeah. has come up with a plan to clear the traffic. So let's get them people off. OK. And let, then it at least looks like we're doing something. OK, it? no problem. Have you got enough resources? Everybody's primary concern is make sure everybody goes home at the end of the day, including the, in, the public. And if that means them sitting there for 60 minutes rather than 30, then that's how long they'll sit there for. What they're doing here now, they're going to reverse the traffic from the front of the queue and send them back off at Junction 9 to try and make their way wherever they've got to be through the trunk roads. It'd be boring, wouldn't it, if it kept running every day? The public love it, really. It's somewhere to mind about when they get home. <laughs> there you say, what are the police doing? Gonna go get some robbers, burglars, muggers and rapists. <laughs> More than two hours later, the lorry and the coils are nearly ready to be moved off the motorway. So that, once that one's off, you're happy? Oh, I'm happy, yeah. I'm happy none, none of them are going to roll into the, into the carriageway. What, is it took two and a half hours? So there's going to be a lot of frustrated motorists in the tailback. And no doubt, when they all go past us up there, they have a few choice words to say to us. It's when the instance cleared, the after effect is, is massive. The motorway is a domino effect. It will just keep snaking back and snaking back and snaking back. Um, and it will carry on for hours after. It's not only badly loaded lorries which are a danger to motorists. Many accidents are caused by drivers falling asleep at the wheel. Truckers can only drive for a maximum of nine hours a day. Most stick to the rules. The ones that don't are hunted down by PC Angus Nairn. It's always good at this time of the night just to have a quick stop check the tacker out, make sure they're all in order. PC Nairn drove lorries for 20 years before he became a motorway cop, so he knows what to look out for. People would say that it's a case of poacher turn gamekeeper, but then again, you've got to know one to be one. And he knows the best time to catch them. It's now almost just gone 10 to 6 at night. These drivers are more than likely started 12 hours ago. Up ahead are two likely contenders. I've stopped them before and I've uh, found the fences on them. So it's always good to check up and just make sure that they are complying. There's a choice between the first or the second one. I've decided to take the second one. So I pick the ones I want to stop and then randomly select eeny, meeny, miny, more. Catch the tiger by the toe. There's more than just chance involved here. PC Nen has a system. The people I go for are the ones that are paid by the mile because they're going to do as many miles in a day as they can possibly get in so they can get paid more and for the ones that are paid by the load because if they can get an extra load done in a week or an extra two loads then they're making more money. Good afternoon driver. Good afternoon. Oh, where are you off to? Sorry? Where are you off to? You speak English? Yes, I speak English, but I have strong Wait, accent. Yeah, strong accent. What have you got on board? Uh, sand. Sand, OK. Quick check of your tachograph, please. Well, Good man, thank you. The tachograph is a recording device that records the amount of driving, the speed of the vehicle and the distance travelled. Today's tachograph seems to be in order. But PC Nairn is digging a little deeper. What have you got for yesterday's charts? No charge yesterday. We are driving mostly, we are carrying a bone mule, so we are using a logbook. Where's your logbook? It's here. Some lorry loads don't require the driver's hours to be monitored by a tachograph, but drivers still have to write down their hours in a logbook. A lot of them try to use the logbook as an exemption, and unless you are up to date with uh, trucks, logbooks, prohibitions, etc., then they would get away with it. But they don't when it's uh, me involved. Oh, fuck. I didn't fill it up. No, no, you didn't fill it in, did you? I was supposed to do that, I... Yeah. How often are you supposed to do it when you're using a logbook? Excuse me? When should you uh -huh. start to fill in the details in the logbook? I should start on Monday. Yeah, and why haven't you? 
I just forgot. No good enough excuse, young man. No, I'm, I'm telling the truth. So of course, it's my fault I agree on that, but... Do you know how many times, how many times people say that I'm telling the truth? Yes, I know. I am. And for every time that was said to me, if I get, you know, a pound, mm -hmm. I'd be a rich man by now. And do you, know how many right. do you know how many times that I prove people are not telling the truth? <laughs> probably, probably. Many yeah, times, but... and I give them chance, after chance, after chance. And you can tell straight away when they're telling you porky pies. And they only go so far, and that's it. We're not doing too well, are we? On the honesty front, are we? Excuse me? You're not doing too well in the honest department. Now, PC Nan has his tiger by the tail. I'm not happy that you still haven't produced a chart for yesterday. I just forget. You don't I, just forget. I have something. Lucas, Lucas, you don't just forget, mm -hmm. right? Come and you can see it in my big car. The driver could have made it a lot easier for himself if at the start, when I first spoke to him, he was honest and admitted exactly what he'd been doing. There's going to be a slight problem here. Because of the fact you're Polish mm -hmm. and you're from Southern Ireland, then you've got to be put before the courts because you'll be reported for the offence. Mm -hmm. The offence of failing to keep records, failing to take a daily rest period, mm -hmm. failing to take a weekly rest but period. the company is registered in Northern Ireland, which is a part of Great Britain. Your address uh -huh. is in the south. That's what you're telling me. No, it's in the north. But you're Polish and you're going back home in two weeks. How do I know you're going to come back to this country? I'm not going back to this country. You're not? No. Well, in that case, I have to deal with you today. So if that's the situation, you're under arrest under Section 24 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. By the time he'd mentioned that he was going back to Poland, my mind had been made up he was going to be arrested and taken to the police station where he could be interviewed. I came here just to search for a better life and now you're saying I'm under arrest. Yeah. I've never been arrested. This is the... Whew, this is the situation. It's... Do you know what they say? I'm There's scared. always a first time for everything, Yes. isn't there? A lot of the drivers, foreign drivers, they tend to come across to the UK and, and Ireland, uh, as they say, to make a better living. But all they're really doing is coming across here for several months, making as much money as they can for driving as many hours as they can, and then going back home. You tell me you've never done this before then? No. Somehow I've I find that hard to believe. A, I've been stopped. Yeah, I can imagine you've been stopped. And you yeah, flash the but... logbook and you say, hey, logbook, because I'm carrying bone meal. Yeah. This is my second week. <laughs> You have to get up early in the morning before you can beat me with that excuse. Have you been in trouble in the UK before? No. No. Once I get the bit between my teeth, then I don't like to let go until I've exhausted all avenues and either got to the bottom of what it is that I'm doing or had a result positively or even negatively. Whether they're Polish, English, Scottish, Irish, German, doesn't really matter. The European rules and regulations are there for the whole lot to comply with, and I make sure they do. The Polish driver will have more explaining to do at the police station. On the M6, 40 miles north, PCs Richard Elliott and Stuart Bullard are watching out for more rule breakers. DGO2. The number plate on this car seems familiar. Let's see who's driving it there. It was a bloke driving it. You can never predict when something is going to happen, and quite often it will be at the point you least expect it to. She's in the passenger seat. You're not going to believe this, mate. He's driving again. The man they stopped from driving just three hours ago is back at the wheel. Unbelievable. He looked like a man who'd found a penny and lost a pound. Where have you suddenly found a license from? We got a friend from Loughborough, you know. Yeah. You haven't got a license. Well, why are you driving? Not good enough, my friend. Not good enough. Come and sit down. Yeah. Come sit down. I, th I think he just basically accepted his fate at that point. Oh. PC Elliot is still going to give him a grilling. So you got a friend from Loughborough to pick the car up for you, yeah? Yeah. So why isn't that friend driving it? 
the new work that we have to leave. And why are you driving it? I thought I could drive it to Liverpool, leave it there. But you haven't got a license and you know that. Yeah, yeah. And you haven't got insurance and you know that. You won't believe this, but we just stopped the uh, Hyundai accent that we seized earlier. You're lucky you're not being arrested because your continued reluctance to obey anything that you've been told today puts you in place of being a persistent, dangerous driver. We're going to take the car up to Junction 15 because we stopped in front of it. There's a young kid in the back not happy about being here, so we'll take it up to 15, we'll get it recovered again and report him again. Um, there's not much point arresting him, it's not going to achieve anything, but the court file will be a bit heavier now, I think. So we'll go and get the vehicle, I'll move the vehicle off up to the next junction, um, and we'll sort out the paperwork again. It's going to be an expensive old day for him. People who drive without documents ha have no reason to obey other laws as well, and you do find, I, mean, I don't know how true it is, but statistically they are supposed to be involved in a higher amount of um, collisions and other things. Once off the motorway, the man and his family are free to go. I'm a motorway cop with a heart, but not this time. My heart's gone. He knew he didn't have a licence, he knew he didn't have insurance. Just what have you got to do to make somebody understand that they can't do it? Oh, we even took his car and that had no effect. But it is the first time that's happened to me so quickly. Somebody come past me within a few hours. Normally takes some days just to sort out getting a, a friend up, but considering he's so far away from home, it's a shame he's not quite so resourceful with actually getting himself legal. Yeah, if you walk that way and turn the corner, there's a hotel. I don't feel mean, I don't feel wicked. I feel sorry for the little boy, but that's about it. This is one for the memoirs, I think. Uh, if I could ever be bothered to sit down and write them. At Worcester Police Station, PC Angus Nairn is about to book in the lorry driver he caught exceeding his driving hours. And he's found out the man has been economical with the truth. When we got to custody, although the driver had claimed that he'd never been in trouble before, we found out that he had been, and it was for the exact same offence. It's not that easy to make. It's got to be a deliberate mistake. People do it, people do it yeah, and people get caught. And you are living proof of that. You've done it, and you've got caught. I don't have a problem with lorry drivers in general. The thing I have a problem with is uh, the lorry drivers who break the rules deliberately uh, for their own gain. It's those drivers that are out there risking the life of everybody else in the motorway. He was stopped for a routine topograph check. He had uh, no records for his previous day or weekly rest period. He's unable to provide a suitable address for service of summons. And he's been arrested in the SOCAP reasons for uh, enabling pro the prompt and effective investigation offence. And so that it can be dealt with by the courts at the earliest possible date. I pointed out the fact that part of the reason that I stop drivers is because of the, the damage they can cause, the danger they are to other road users. PC Nairn has no regrets about locking the man up. If he was to be allowed to carry on, there's no saying, you know, he could fall asleep in an hour. He could continue driving for the next six hours. But there could be one of these days where he drives in excess of these hours that he's supposed to, doesn't have enough rest, and then he just needs to nod off, close his eyes for a couple of minutes, and, you know, we could end up with multiple fatal, which is what we're trying to avoid. As night falls across the motorway network, some lorry drivers park up to rest, while others use this time to take advantage of the quieter roads. On the M62 near Hull, traffic cops Sergeant Rob Mazingham and PC Simon Carlisle from Humberside Police 
are receiving reports of a major accident. Only four vehicles involved. A multiple pileup involving an HGV is their worst nightmare. The report came in, there was a lorry involved, there were casualties, some of them serious, and that there were children in the carriageway, and you're thinking, worst case scenario, really. The ones that I find the worst ones are the ones where you're not expecting it and you just come across it. At least when you've been sent and you know you've got several vehicles and people trapped, I think you condition your mind to what you're about to see. When you hear that a lorry's been involved in a collision, particularly on the motorway, where speed can be involved due to the size and weight of, of a lorry, obviously you're immediately concerned in case uh, people have been killed. Uh, watch for cones on the hard shoulder due to the lane closure. Sirens on. XH Charlie Sierra 1 just uh, negotiating the tailback now. I was getting feedback over the radio as to the extent um, of the, the collision and the fact that all three lanes were blocked. Do you want to shut in then? Yeah, get it, just get it shut. Yeah, from Charlie Sierra 8-1 then, can we shut the motorway? Shut the motorway at junction 36 and can we have a ghoul unit, if there are any, to shut the onslaught over? It was obvious to me I was going to have to shut the road from a, a safety perspective to ensure that we didn't have any other collisions uh, as a result of what had already happened. Right. We'll go and find out what the score is and then we'll work on road closures from... Yeah. Challenge from, uh, 003, just confirm the location where we're watching and the only one available. Fire brigade were already on scene, so the scene was well lit. There were people everywhere, um, and and debris and cars uh, all over the place. My first priority is casualties. Where are they? Are there any that aren't accounted for? In lane two, a team of firefighters are trying to free a man from his overturned car. We we'll talk about a, a golden hour. Last thing we wanted to do was to get in the way of um, ambulance and, and fire brigade as they struggled to, to release a gentleman from his, his vehicle. He's not the only casualty. A 37-year-old woman and a young man have been killed. Jamie's behind me, he's the one sat down, so he's the guy that you might want to talk to. Incredibly, a 15-year-old passenger, Jamie, has survived. Oh, I'm going to be around. If you need anything, give us a shout. Yeah, okay? I, will, I will do. I'll leave you all that to just do what they've okay. got to do. Once they get sorted out, I'll come out and chat with you. Is it Rob? Rob, okay, yeah. We'll all right. Minute, okay, tough, Jim. When I, I hear there are fatalities, the main feeling is one of sadness. Um, and from having done this job quite a long time, the, the fact that more than likely it would have been preventable. This kid here, he's out, I believe, the back car down there. I saw paramedics with uh, a young lad. He had blood streaming from his face. He might not know they're dead yet, but can we get his details and the details of anybody who was in the car with? All right, right. Is, it, is that where the two deceased are yeah. in his car? Yeah, so it could be anti or, or something else. So. I wanted to make sure he got off into an ambulance and, and really try and establish the identity of who else was in the car. Who were you in the car with? My mum and my cousin, I think. Your mum and your cousin? He was obviously very, very shaken, very you know, stuttery and, and very difficult to get information from. Where do you live, Jamie? Right. Jamie is still unaware that his mum and his cousin have died. The kid from the car, yeah. the survivor in the car, has gone to Doncaster Hospital. He's going to want an FLR. Um, yeah. So can I, can I leave you to get on to comms with regards to sorting out FLOs for us? Yeah. We're going to need... Um, it's all the same family in the car for the two in the car. We're going to want another. We're going to, we're going to want four. If you can get, get me four. Once I was aware that there were confirmed fatalities, we require family liaison officers, especially trained officers, who will um, deal with the families of the deceased. Sergeant Mazingham tries to piece together exactly what has happened. It's a little bit unclear at the moment, but I think what, what we've got is we've had traffic stationary in lanes one and two. I believe due to a minor accident on the M18. It looks like a lorry has failed to say that the traffic's been stationary, it's come down, ploughed into the back of the rear vehicle and then caused the domino effect, shunting it into about six other vehicles. 
one vehicle has gone down the embankment and we, we know that we've got two fatalities um, in that one. We've got one person currently in lane two, a vehicle that's overturned, trapped, and they're, they're being released. Um, we're not sure of their injuries at the moment. And then we've got seven or eight other ones with walking wounded, really, minor injuries. Um, and obviously we've got traffic chaos, so at the moment it's just trying to establish who's from what vehicle. Ambulance is to go. Do you need to mark it at all before we move it? PC Carlisle now turns his attention to the investigation which will follow. I actually saw what happened, if you want to... Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just giving me a, a yeah, brief uh, overview of what you say, sir. Um, I, I was in a queue of traffic here, that's my car on the outside yeah. lane there. I was in a queue of traffic. Yeah. Um, I'd heard that there was an accident on the M M18, so yeah. I was queuing to get off the slip road. Yeah. I looked in my, in my rear view mirror, so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go down to the A1 and put down that yeah. one. So I looked in my rear view mirror to pull out into the middle lane, and if I hadn't have done, that would have been me. Because I pulled out, and that lorry there was coming like, well, he was coming like shit. He was, right. he was going at a right speed. Obviously, he wasn't concentrating on what was happening. He just ploughed straight into the back of these cars. He was probably our best witness. From an evidential point of view, you couldn't have been any closer. But from a, a human point of view, he was seconds from losing his own life. We got a good few witness statements from, you know, sort of five to ten cars back, especially in lane three. In the uh, offside mirror, I saw a, a car spinning around and one going onto its roof and, and saw the cars coming out at angles. And then this, this uh, lad called Dave, in a lot of pain and, and writhing around, I just tried to uh, calm him down and so you, you just, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I said, uh, are you where, where, where you're at? It's my chest, my chest. And it, 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 obviously conscious who it, it, it were talking to me. Uh, I, I just cradled his head and, and just got him to just relax and try, and try and get comfy as he could in his car, you know. Dave, the badly injured man trapped in his car, has finally been freed by firefighters. The uh, occupants from Foxtrot Victor, Zero Two, Victor Tango Delta, have now been released from the vehicle. What age have we got from them? I'm not sure. It's, it's internal serious life threatening to Doncaster. Just updating the log. From that one. Now the injured are dealt with, Sergeant Mazingham must decide how to move Jamie's mum and his cousin. At the scene, if, if we, we have fatalities, then they're treated with the utmost respect. But. Ultimately, our, our initial and main concern has got to be with those who we may, whose lives we may well be able to save. Can someone just put the light on the female, please? Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the lad in the back, yeah, you're, you're going to need to cut him off. Yeah, no, we'll go with your plan of just, we'll get it recovered. Back to I could see that a female driver and rear seat passenger had been severely compressed by, I imagined, the lorry colliding with the rear of the vehicle uh, and then squashing that vehicle to a degree where the, the Cavalier had um, severely shrunk in length. Yeah. It was obvious that um, both fatalities had got serious crush injuries as a result of, of the vehicle being compacted. So what we're proposing, once everything's happened, we'll have the vehicle recovered to a recovery agent warehouse or whatever, and then the fire brigade hopefully will assist us to extract the, uh, the two people. So uh, it's going to be a long job, I think. At the time, I, I find it will manage to come to deal with it as just part of the job, um, and you need to get on with it. It's it's only later when you reflect, or maybe when you go home and you're speaking to your family, that you you start to see the more human side of it and, and start to think about the effects that it will have had on people. The driver of the lorry which hit the cars has remained in his cab. I want somebody with that lorry driver all the time, really. He's sat just having a cup of tea, perfectly all right, but he's sat in his, in his wagon. If you can just go and um, just get an initial comment from him under course and see what he's, he's got to say about it. I went up to the lorry really just to check that the driver was there and that he was all right. He used to be treated as a victim like everybody else. He was, uh, he was clearly quite shaken. Lorry driver's been breathalyzed, that was a negative. And he's basically said, I was pulling along, I just saw red lights in front, I didn't know what happened, and bang. More evidence of the impact is coming in. 
All of it points to the lorry driver failing to notice the cars ahead of him. Uh, I could see just through my mirror that he was getting closer and closer and then bang. Based on the witness's evidence, I was putting the blameworthiness down to that of the driver of the lorry that collided with the rear of the traffic. The traffic is being turned back down the motorway while the investigation teams continue their work. Turning all the vehicles around can be a, a very slow operation. One, because it involves reversing a large number of vehicles, a lot of which were, were heavy goods vehicles. And police family liaison officers have arrived to be briefed on the latest information before they go to talk to Jamie and the other relatives of those killed and injured. Now, lad is at Doncaster, he's walking wounded. But he's unaware that mum's dead. Right, uh, he might be. The ambulance staff knew and knew he didn't know, so they've probably passed it on to hospital staff. But we've probably got five, six other injured parties from the collision there. As a family liaison officer, um, we have to deliver bad news. There is no easy way to tell anybody that somebody they love dearly won't be coming home. Right, well, we're just waiting to see what speed we can get off the tachograph, and I suspect when Mr Andrew is now arriving, he's going to get locked up. An expert has also arrived to examine the lorry's tachograph to find out just how fast it was going. Right, well, this, this is the tachograph unit up here. It's uh, the new digital type, so in effect, it almost looks like a, like a radio. The digital tachograph, really, is, uh, is the equivalent of the, um, of the aviation world's black box or flight recorder. Um, it tells us a lot of information about what the vehicle has been doing um, leading up to the incident. Stored on that chip, there will be all, all the information that you saw on the printout. And uh, we've had a quick look at them. Um, nothing unduly to worry about at the moment, but uh, we'll need to do a, a more in-depth download and um, have a look at it once we've put it through the programme and see what sort of speeds we're coming up. Um, looking at the physical evidence, uh, I would think there's been a fair bit of speed involved when it actually hit the back of the, uh, the vehicles. I'm going to just go down and establish what's happened. It's now a triple, yeah. so if you can just stand in abeyance until I get some instructions as to what he's going to want doing. We've got uh, three dead people uh, confirmed now. Uh, two from the rearmost vehicle, which was a a Vauxhall Cavalier, uh, and one from uh, a Honda CRV, which uh, at the minute we're thinking was the uh, third most vehicle in the queue uh, that was waiting to go onto the M18. The news of the fatalities is given to the lorry driver. I do feel sympathy for that driver because he must be searching himself. The families want the answer as to why did that happen? What happened in those seconds? Why did why did the lorry hit those cars? The driver of the goods vehicle uh, has been arrested uh, for section one, causing death by dangerous driving. Uh, he's been taken to Beverly Police Station where he'll be interviewed very briefly initially. Uh, clearly he'll be in uh, some shock um, and that interview will be basically to give an account of what's happened uh, in the initial stages. Uh, he'll be bailed to come back to the police station uh, uh, in a few weeks time uh, where um, when he's obviously legally represented um, he'll, be, he'll be further interviewed um, into exactly what's happened and his reasons for apparently not slowing down towards the actual tail end of the queue that was there and, and clearly visible and everyone else was able to see. The accident investigation will continue throughout the night. The next day, at a recovery yard near Hull, the lorry is about to be checked over by mechanics. PC Carlisle is still on duty. I do wonder whether the driver realises that he's driving up to 44 tonnes of missile at 56 miles an hour along the road. A lorry laden with, with wood into the back of stationary traffic is a lethal weapon. The lorry is being given a comprehensive examination to check for defects. But we want to know why that's happened. Okay. Was it a brake failure? Was the accelerator stuck on the lorry? 
how it stands at the moment, there's no faults yeah. live on this vehicle. I look at an investigation like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, we don't know exactly why the lorry went into the back of the traffic. We'd love to, and there's there's this great big, you know, gap in the in the jigsaw puzzle as to why he actually did that. The car which took the brunt of the collision in which Jamie's mum and cousin died is battered almost beyond recognition. The vehicle's been foreshortened quite some considerable distance. Here we have what is in effect the, the rear of the roof uh, and here's the, the tailgate. And this should be somewhere back here um, by right. So in effect it's, it's closed that aperture up from two foot six, something like that, down to less than a foot. <laughs> It's horrendous distortion of the, of the vehicle. It's a miracle that anybody has survived and, and for, the, for the front near side passengers to get out is, is quite miraculous, really. The car cut open by firefighters to release the man, who later died in hospital, is also being examined to try to shed some light on exactly what happened. The Honda CRV that had been spun around and was laid on its offside even had damage in the floor area where it had been struck from underneath. It was very worrying to learn that the, the lorry driver couldn't remember the seconds before the collision. The families want answers, which is perfectly natural, and it is very, very frustrating when you can't tell them. Nearly a year later, the case against the lorry driver is about to come to court. Family liaison officer PC Steve Youngson is visiting Jamie, who lost his mother and his aunt Julie, who lost her son. By this time, I'd spent some time with Julie and Jamie, got to know them and um, had some understanding of their loss. Jamie, who survived the accident with just cuts and bruises, is now living with Julie and her partner Brian. Next week, as you're aware, we've got the plea and direction hearing. Yeah. Um, the driver of the lorry, Mr Abel, will be appearing before the Crown Court in Hull. Um, he will then be given the opportunity to plead guilty or not guilty to the offences for which he's been charged. Unfortunately for Julie, she lost both a sister and a son in the collision. You know it's happened, but I suppose you don't want it to sink in because you don't want to believe what's happened. It's like living a nightmare. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't ever seem to get much better. Yeah, you have good days, you have bad days, uh, as Julie does. It's just something you have to learn to live with. I've lost two special people, my son and my sister, who were very, very close. I think there'll always be anger there. Because my son had just started college. Julie's son, Stig, was just 17. I think they should definitely review the law on dangerous driving because it, it, it's wrong, it's wrong. When you get in a vehicle, you're in charge, basically, of a killing machine. Yeah, most people set out not to kill somebody, you know, or to maim them but they've got to be aware that's what can happen very, very easily. 90 miles away near Retford in Lincolnshire, Jackie Goodridge is also trying to come to terms with her loss. Dave Goodridge died in hospital after being cut free from his car by firefighters. You never believe it's going to happen to you. You read about it in papers. You see it on TV. Um, 
but you disassociate yourself from it. And even when it happens, you don't truly believe it's happened. Because I'm finding this a surreal experience, I keep feeling as if Dave, at the end of all of this, Dave is suddenly going to reappear. Whatever happens, David won't come back. Nothing will change. The lorry driver didn't leave home that morning deliberately to kill my husband. Um, and I have to accept that, as hard as it might be. And we always said, you know, we did not believe in an eye for an eye. And the lorry driver has to face this for the rest of his life. Um, and that, I think, will be hard enough for him. He got no previous convictions for any driving offence. It just highlights the issue that it doesn't matter how experienced you are, how professional you are, you just cannot switch off for one minute when you're driving a vehicle of any type, but particularly a large goods vehicle. The lorry driver pleaded guilty to death by dangerous driving and was sentenced to four years in prison. He was also disqualified from driving for six years. He offered no explanation as to why he failed to see the traffic ahead of him. The driver of the tipper truck that hit the rear of the car, injuring the woman driver, received four points on his license and was fined a total of £500 for driving without due care and attention. The trucker who failed to keep proper records was cautioned and prohibited from driving for 11 hours. No action has yet been taken against the driver of the lorry that shed its load of two-ton steel coils. And the Chinese couple paid their fine and got their car back for a second time but the driver has still not applied for a UK driving licence. <laughs>